add my thanks to our, uh, our worship team today, for everyone who's helped in so many different ways. Beverly on the organ and uh, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for coming. And to Sarah and Eva and, um, you know, I don't want to leave anyone. I saw the, a lot of Heisies picking up offering. Appreciate that. Thank you guys for helping out. Uh, it's so good to have you. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate with this being a graduation weekend uh, to talk about um, finishing strong or a strong finish. And I'm going to be using a story that's from a few years back, and I've, I've done chapels with it and devotionals and things, so it was some material that I, I felt would be good to use also today for, the, for my sermon um, on finishing strong or a strong finish. And so uh, before I go any further though I'd like to just to bow my head one more time invite you to also bow your head let's pray to the Lord and uh, ask him to continue being with us God in heaven we we open up our hearts to you right now Lord it is uh, all about you is why we are here and we we love uh, our fellowship we love our church we love our families that we can gather with Lord but we come before your altar right now and we just ask that your Holy Spirit would be in this place that would be in our hearts and in our minds, that all the other distractions and obstacles and barriers of, of this week would be set aside. And in this moment, Lord, your voice would be heard. So Lord, thank you so much for hearing us and for speaking to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, I have a little abbreviated kids quiz uh, today, not as many questions as I normally would have, but I do have a few. And so um, I think they're pretty straightforward. So to our kids here, if you just raise your hand and help me out, I would appreciate it. Um, the first one is this. The Bible often compares the Christian life to a race. What kind of race do you think uh, the Scripture means? And I have some multiple choice here. Um, a hundred-meter sprint, a one-mile dash, a marathon, or maybe a relay race. To, what, what kind of race do you think the Bible is referring to? Okay, Owen? A relay race, and you know, it is a, uh, a metaphor, so there are ways you can look at it as a relay race, uh, you, know, uh, you know, each part of the team doing their part and passing the baton. I think that could be worked with, but I don't think that's the primary one, so maybe there's a different one, and Anna's so excited to raise her hand, her mom had to help her. Anna? Okay, she said the word marathon. Addie, were you going to say the same thing? I knew you were. You had the right answer. I think that is the more likely analogy of a race that the Bible is talking about when it talks about the Christian life as a race. It's not something that's over and done, you know, just like that. Just, you know, boom, you're done like a dash or a sprint. It's more of an endurance uh, reality. So we're going we're gonna to look at that. Who said this? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Who said that? And I should have multiple choices. It's going to be a double click today, I guess, to get where we need. Do you think, does Jesus say that? Peter, John, or Paul? Do you know that? Okay, I, I saw Toby first. He'll probably get it wrong, though, Leah. We'll be right to you in a second. Toby? Oh, <laughs> he got it right. <laughs> Shocky. Uh, were you going to say that, too? Yeah. That, that is the Apostle Paul there in 2 Timothy, probably some of the last words he ever wrote. And he compares in his life... And this is where you get the idea of a marathon. I have finished the course. I've gotten to the end of my life, and I have kept the faith. And Paul uses the analogy of races and, and, and that uh, quite a bit in his, uh, in his writings as well. Oh, and this is the last one I have for us this morning. As I said, it's just an abbreviated one. Where was Jesus when he spoke the words, it is finished? Where was he? Was he in the garden? Was he... Um, haven't been on this side of the church yet. I better come over here to keep it fair. So now, Gabby, was that one of these? I'm um, just checking my hair, or what do you say? You are right. Jesus was on the cross when he said, "It is finished." Now he wasn't necessarily talking in the same analogy or metaphor of the race that I've won run has is finished, but he is giving us that same imagery of the path that I have been on. The work that God has given me to do, I have been faithful in that work, and now as I hang upon the cross, I can say with confidence, the work is done. It 
is finished. And I think we can all agree that Jesus was a strong finisher. He was strong in his faith as he finished that. In all the darkness and all of the trial and all the pain and suffering that he went through, he never gave up on God. And he kept his faith. Even when he couldn't even see the Father and he cried out, why have you forsaken me? He still um, referred to him as his Father. And uh, um, he was a strong finisher. Um, probably one of the passages that is preached on as much as any other passage in the Bible comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And again, it has this idea of the race. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, this is right after Hebrews 11, when there's all these examples of wonderful individuals who have stayed faithful. Um, he says, we have such a great cloud, uh, an array of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance. Okay, and there again you get the idea of a marathon, right? Uh, that's an endurance race. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, uh, I'm going to have to restrain myself because there's so much in this passage, but one thing I do want to just mention very briefly is that the word used here for sin, the sin uh, the every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us is a very unique word. And there, no two commentaries that I've ever found has the same way of analyzing what, uh, what the message is here. It's probably Hebrews, probably written by the Apostle Paul, what Paul meant here. But um, I, I like C.D. Brooks' definition when he said it's the well-stood-around sin. In other words, the sin that, that Paul is referring to is the sin that no one else thinks is a sin— but you know it's a sin. That's the sin he's referring to here. The, no one else, everyone else says, that's not that, it's a little white lie, right? It's just a little thing on your taxes. Ooh, did you do your taxes, right? Uh, no one's watching, right? It's the sin, it's the well stood around sin. It's the sin that everyone stands around and say, it's really not a big deal, but in your heart, you know it's a big deal. He, Paul says, even that, we need to lay aside and run that endurance race, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So I want to talk about a race uh, this morning. On April 15th, 2013, around 30,000 runners came to Boston to run the 117th annual Boston Marathon. It's one of the uh, best-known uh, marathons in the world, one of the best attended. It's difficult to get into the Boston Marathon. Unlike other marathons uh, that don't normally have the numbers, you have to qualify to get into the Boston Marathon. You can't just walk up that day and say, okay, I'd like to run. You have to have qualifying times. And they turn away thousands of people every year from being able to run the Boston Marathon. Um, so it's a privilege to be able to run it. It's, a, it's an amazing tradition. And uh, they began that race. And uh, just before 3 o'clock uh, on that day, it happened to be tax day. Um, you remember what happened. Two pressure cooker bombs had been placed near the finish line. They went off 12 seconds apart, um, uh, affecting mostly bystanders because they were on the sides of the road. Um, it created immediate chaos, as you can imagine, and panic. The thing that's interesting about this picture is obviously it was just a picture of the race, and there's the flash of light. No one is looking. Here you have all these officials. They haven't even noticed it yet. I mean, the, the, the picture was just, forgive the language here, perfect as far as timing. They just caught the flash, and none of the racers had caught attention yet, none of the officials. Um, the, the, the bombs were designed to create as much damage as possible. They were filled with nails and shrapnel. Um, and uh, it, it was, a, you know, obviously the work of a, a terrorist. And I don't even, you know, want to give credence to their name or their cause in mentioning it because it was just ridiculous and horrendous. Obviously, it caught the attention of our nation and uh, created an immediate, you know, panic and awareness, you know, and, and, and outcry um, throughout our, our whole country as we uh, came to grips with the reality that someone could do something like this and so random and uh, we'd already dealt with so many other things as a country. Again, this is 2013, so I know 
uh, a lot has happened since then. But you know, some tragedies and crises, and crises tear us apart and others draw us together. This is one that really as a country brought the country together. Um, the, the, the phrase, Boston Strong, you know, for, for years became a reference to, we're going to be overcomers, we're going to come together on this. We're not going to allow this to, to ruin our, our ability to be Americans and support one another and to live the American dream. And, and so there was all this, these stories that came out of, of uh, how the city and, and the nation, really, schools and, and, and all across the country and even over in, in the, uh, across the world, there was just uh, an enormous outcry, uh, uh, outcry for support and unity. I love this picture uh, of the Yankees fan holding up Yankee fans love Boston because, friends, Yankee fans do not love Boston. <laughs> you know that if a Yankee fan holds up a sign like that, they were deeply moved and touched. Um, and so I just, you know, in the sports world, you have these rivalries and things like that. So you can see the power of a moment like this out of tragedy, out of so much, you know, pain and everything that happened, what it, it did for our country and for our people. Obviously, there was some terrible... Um, uh, results of this. There were three killed by the bombs, 264 wounded, 29 were critically wounded, 16 uh, amputations, people who uh, had limbs amputated, and over 5,000 unable to finish the race. At three o'clock, most the runners that were real runners had completed the race. Um, uh, the, at the end, so you only had out of the 30,000, you know, you had the last 5,000 or so that hadn't completed it yet. So it was late in the day when the bomb went off. Here are the three who died. Martin Richards is eight years old. I brought these because I'm kind of the kind of person that still cries in movies and uh, chicken soup for the soul, so... Christy Campbell, 29, and then Lou, what do you see? Um, if you can't read it, he says, no more hurting people with the word peace. It's just so wrong, isn't it? And every death is a tragedy, but, you know, eight years old, it just really gets to you. And in a very chilling moment, in a chilling picture, there's Martin Richards, and there's the bomber, and there's the bomb. Oops, I don't know if I did that. Oh, okay. So you can see where he is in comparison to the bomb. That's his sister, Jane. Um, Martin is killed. Jane, her hair is completely burned off. When they found her, they thought she was actually a boy because she had no hair. And she did receive uh, injuries, but Martin died. And they were there cheering on right at the end of the race. Um, and so you have all these runners and these individuals impacted by it. Boston Marathon officials invited back the runners who are unable to complete the 2013 race to the next one, the 118th Marathon 2014. Now you have to keep in mind, these races are not just community events. These are highly regulated events. Um, there are sponsors, there are, uh, there's gambling involved, things like that. It, it's highly unusual that they bend the rules for something like that. But obviously after such a tragedy, they bent the rules. And so they allowed these runners to come back and um, more than 5,000 said they're coming back. And again, what just impresses me is you know, you would think, I'm never going to go near that type of thing again, right? If bombs are going to go off, I'm, I'm not going to be there. But 5,000 of them said, I'm coming back. And it's just that it, it shows you the resiliency of, of, of people, including many of those who lost legs. Now, there's a couple of stories that I want to share with you um, about this event that is just powerful, and I, I hope we can learn something from it. I want to talk about some individuals. This is Celeste Cochran. Interestingly, her husband's name is Kevin Cochran, but not Kevin Cochran, who's Moochie from Disney, um, uh, but the same name and same spelling. This is Celeste Cochran. This is her daughter, Sydney. They were at the finish line on, in 2013 waiting to, to see Carmen, that's Celeste's sister, uh, finish the race. Well, of course, the bomb went off. Uh, Sydney was injured, and as you can see, Carmen 
uh, received significant injuries and lost both of her legs. Carmen remembers, I don't know, okay, Carmen remembers after the moment when the bomb went off and she's in excruciating pain, she's lying there. In one of the articles, she says, I wish that I would die. I said to myself, I'd rather be dead than go through this pain right now. But she said almost at the same instant she thought that, you know, I had the brain is just going, she said, no, no, I don't want to die. I want to live. And uh, just in that moment, you know, as, as all the panic is going on, she was able to get medical support and she survived, but sadly lost both of her legs. Now in 2014, those who'd lost legs, they did not run the entire race. They were allowed to come in a half mile from the finish. So this is her with her daughter and her sister crossing the finish line. Amazing. Amazing on these double leg, uh, they call them blades. Those cost $25,000 a piece, and most insurances don't cover them. Which is why there are advocacy groups and foundations and donors that raise money to do this for, for these individuals that go through this. Um, there's just obviously designed specifically for running and, and aerobics. It's not the normal type of, of prosthesis that you would get. But just to see them, it's powerful, isn't it? It's moving. Um, it's crazy. This is Heather Abbott. Heather Abbott lost her left, left leg there. Um, this was at uh, just before the 2014. They did a kind of uh, memorial or ceremonial moment for those affected by the, uh, by the bomb to, to go onto the racetrack. She did also do what uh, Celeste did, and there will be a picture of that in just a second. But the thing about Heather Abbott that is, uh, is, is, is cool, again, she was a spectator, and when the bomb went off, she was thrown into a restaurant. I mean, literally just thrown across the sidewalk, crashing through the glass in the window. Body is just bloody, and, and she's dazed and kind of crying out for help, and just absolute panic. Racers going everywhere, people fearing, but out of all that panic, two people stopped. It's just amazing to me. It was Matt and Aaron Chatham. Matt was a former lineman. Uh, for the New England Patriots. So I guess there is something good that comes out of the New England Patriots. Matt and Aaron Chatham, they stop, and in the middle of that carnage, they pick up her broken body, and they carry her, and they save her life. Now, I don't know about you, but that would create a moment in my life. Here she is on the race day, crossing the finish line with her, and who do you think that is with her? That's Aaron Chatham. They've become lifelong friends. And she, uh, Heather Abbott, has started a foundation um, to help people who've lost limbs. And I am almost sure I saw her on Bloomsday once, but I didn't realize it at the time. I think Heather Abbott probably came to Spokane when we did Bloomsday. Um, so, again, just to see the perseverance of these individuals, it just, ah, it's wonderful. They're, they're the type of stories we need to hear more about. This is Patrick Downs and uh, Jessica Kinsky. This is in September of 2012. They're not running a race. They're doing something else. They got married. They got married seven months before the race. And you can imagine all the hopes and dreams that they had in their early life of marriage and determining. I don't think that they expected uh, seven months later to be going through this. And having both of them go through this excruciating experience. They survive, of course. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, there are three who lost their lives. Um, but both of them lost their left leg initially. Um, Jessica has since also had her right leg amputated. They wanted to amputate it right away. The doctors did. Uh, but she had good bone in her right leg, if I recall the story right. But the, uh, the bomb removed all of her ligaments and tendons. And so the doctor said, you're not going to have much use of that. We really ought to. But she tried, she tried, she tried. And I think it was in 2017. Uh, she just was in too much pain. And she said, yes, I need to have both legs. So she's actually lost both her, her legs. Their dog's name is Rescue. And Rescue was a therapy dog that was given to them. And they've actually written a book about how much Rescue has rescued them. 
and uh, it's a real tribute to canine therapy and, and the, uh, what uh, an animal can mean to people who go through such um, a depression. I have friends who've lost just tips of their fingers in, you know, uh, uh, you know, woodworking and table saws and stuff like that. They lost just tips of their singers, fingers, and they had to go into counseling for the depression they went through. And I'm not trying to say that's a mini, mino thing, but losing any part of your body is not normal to us, and it does things with our minds. When people lose major parts of their body, um, it just is uh, incredible when they can still rebound and find strength to move forward. And so uh, rescue became a major part of their, uh, of their life. And here they are in 2014. They were, unable, they were unable to run, but they were allowed as para, para athletes, is that what they're called, um, to bike across. And so that was a great moment for them when they crossed the finish line. Just, just a year later, just a year, I, I just, it still boggles my mind the resiliency and, and the ability of individuals to overcome. A lot of support went out. Now, uh, there's a, another amazing story. In 2016, Patrick Downs became the first amputee from the 2013 tragedy to fully run the Boston Marathon. He started at the very beginning. It wasn't one of these, you know, ceremony things where you, they just let him in in the last half mile. He started at the very beginning, and he ran 26.2 miles three years after having an artificial limb put on him. And here he is crossing the finish line. This is him <laughs> greeting the Richard family. That's uh, Jane who lost all her hair. That's her mom. And uh, there's her dad, uh, uh, Martin Richard's father, giving him a hug. And there's uh, Heather Abbott. Um, I mean, just the whole community of those affected were there celebrating uh, Patrick. He kind of did it for all of them, you know. He says, I'm doing this for everybody that was affected. And just, I just love it. It's just powerful. Out of such challenge, out of such tragedy to say, I'm going to get back up and I'm not going to let this keep me down. Now, it's not about finishing a race. Okay, it's not, that's not what the issue here is. It's about them finishing life. You know, not giving up, not letting anything, you know, remove them from doing their very best. Now, the last uh, story I want to tell you about is a little bit different. In the middle here, you have uh, Jeff Glass, Glassbrenner, if I've said his name right. Um, he was in the 2013 Boston Marathon. Um, Andrew and uh, Chris Madison were not. Um, but he was at mile 15 in the Boston Marathon in 2013 when his blade went in a pothole and he stumbled and fell down and cut his knee. And so every about mile after that, he had to stop and tend to this knee that he cut. And the interesting thing was he was three blocks from the finish line when the bombs went off. And he always kind of, you know, uh, sp spooked him at the thought, if I had not fallen, if I'd not stumbled, he was at mile 25.9, right, when the bomb went off at uh, 26.2 miles. And he always wondered, if I'd not fallen, would I have been in the carnage? Would I have been affected? And so he, uh, uh, he, has, he uh, lost his leg when he was eight in a farming accident. And he's, he's been an advocate for para-athletes. And uh, um, so he got two friends that he knew, Andrew Slay, who I think was a, a travel agent or worked at an airport. I forget what Andrew Slade did. And then Chris Madison and said, guys, we got to run the Boston Marathon 2014. And Andrew said, I have never even ran, Andre, excuse me, Andre. Um, he says, I've never even run a 5K. I don't think I could do it. And he says, no, we're going to do it. We're going to run this. And so they trained for that year. Um, they had to get special equipment made for them and, and go through all that. And here they are, 26.2 miles crossing the finish line in 2014. The only reason I, I really wanted to include this story as part of, of this because they were not affected by the bomb is just that all, and I know the picture's grainy, I kind of had to blow it up, is um, I just love the brotherhood. There's no white privilege there. There's no racism there. It's just three brothers pulled together through a common struggle and being able to achieve. You know how many Americans cannot walk 26.2 miles? Um, to be able to run with missing body parts, 26.2 miles. Uh, 
I'm just amazed. And I give them enormous credit for that. These are powerful, powerful moments and stories that just inspire me when we think about the race that we are in. And it is a race of life. And we meet obstacles in our race as well. The verse uh, in Hebrews continues, Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the what? The finisher of our faith. Christ doesn't just kick us in this journey and say, I hope you make it, and whatever happens, just pull yourself up. No, he's there every step of the way, promising and helping and supporting us, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Did Jesus have some obstacles in his path? Despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 13, 6 says, We may confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? I just love the, the almost passive aggressiveness of that passage. What can you really do to me when the Lord is my helper? And we could, we could spend a whole discussion, too, on what it means that Christ is our helper. Here he's quoting from Psalm 118. And people get bogged down in this idea, well, if Christ's helping, then I'm doing some and he's doing some. It means that Christ is on our side. If Jesus is on your side, what can you not accomplish? You know, it'd be like I've seen commercials, uh, I don't even know what they're advertising, but where kids on the courtyard um, are choosing their team and Shaq happens to be there, right? And you say, well, I want Shaq. You know, and if you're, if you're a third grader and you got Shaq on your team, you think you're going to win? There's a pretty good, he may have put on a little weight and everything, but he still has a bit of an advantage, okay? All right, we have someone even better than Shaq, all right? With Jesus on our side, what can we not accomplish, guys? We should not be surprised at the challenges we're going to face in this race that we're on. No one expected when they went to the Boston Marathon in 2013 that they would be losing their loved one, or losing their limb. They were, they were not expecting that. But we as Christians, we've been forewarned uh, that we will face trials. That we are going to be opposed. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress? Why do you think Paul said that? Because tribulation and distress will come to try to give, get you to give up on this race, to throw in the towel. But none of that will separate us from Jesus' love for us. If we don't give up on Him, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, these stories inspire me. These stories, if people can build back their lives after these types of tragedies, what is the devil doing in your life right now to try to make you give up? What unexpected trials, what distresses are in your life? And if you say, hey, all oh, life is good, nothing's going on. Well, why, are, why isn't the devil interested in you? <laughs> yeah. With Christ as our helper, we can be overcomers. Let's all be strong finishers. Um, I have a, just a minute left, and so I want to include one more thing that I've always appreciated. You remember Pilgrim's Progress? You familiar with that? I, I love the story. I used to have big parts of it memorized. I had this part memorized, but I didn't want to try to do it. When, when Christian falls into the slough of despond, you remember that? First, it's early on in his journey, and Pliable comes along with him. And Pliable is always kind of complaining and you know, wanting to go back uh, to the city of destruction. If you've not read the story, Taylor, just bear with me, okay? You'll, you'll, you'll catch it at something. I still think it's the number two bestseller in the world. Uh, even to this day, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, but he falls into the, the slough of despond. It's like the pit of despair. Oh, have you seen the uh, never-ending story? It's like the swamps of sadness, right? Have you seen the never-ending story? Oh, 
Sandy, what are we going to do? My goodness. I guess I was just exposed to a lot more cinema when I was growing up. Anyways, this is what uh, John Bunyan writes about the slough of despond. The miry slough is such a place as cannot be mended. It is the descent, whether the scum and filth that attends conviction for sin doth continually run. And therefore it is called the slough of despond. For still as the sinner is awakened about his lost condition, there ariseth in his soul many fears and doubts and discouraging apprehensions, which all of them get together and settle in this place. And this is the reason for the badness of this ground. And when Christian is in that, he calls out help. And help appears in the form of Jesus Christ. And Pliable gives up and goes back to the city of destruct, uh, to the city of destruct, city of destruction. But help, the person of Jesus Christ, comes and he lifts Christian up out of the slough of despond, out of that swamp of sadness. And friends, Jesus is always, always there to pull us up out of that miry clay. When you cry out to him, Christ is our helper. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. We've had some trials this last year, and the trials are not just going to go away instantaneously. The devil has other ones planned. Don't be surprised. But be ready to have the help of Jesus Christ at your side every step of the way and be a strong finisher. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, these are, are tragic memories in so many ways of lives altered, lives lost in such a senseless way. And yet out of that, Lord, there are these silver linings. There are these inspirations. There are these individuals who overcome, who rise above. And although this is just a, an earthly race, this is just a, a, uh, a momentary thing that they are, are uh, overcoming, Lord, it just speaks volumes to the ability of the human soul, given the right opportunity to rise above challenges, Lord. And we know, Lord, that there are deep spiritual challenges that we have faced, we are facing, and we will face in the future, Lord. But as we look at the great cloud of witnesses, as we go through the Bible stories, as we go through history, as we think about the reformers, the martyrs, as we think about those even in the story of the Boston Marathon, those who will not allow even the loss of a limb or even the loss of a child to keep them from continuing on a pathway of victory and success and overcoming, Lord, it inspires us, Father. And it makes us want to cry out to you all the more, Lord, come and be our helper. Help us to finish this race, no matter what's happened. Some of us may feel like our feet have been cut out from under us. We may have lost jobs. We may have lost family members. We may have lost all kinds of opportunities, Lord. But out of that, your miracle and your power can still shine forth all the more. So God, as we move on in this journey, draw us close to you, Father. Help us to know no matter what miry clay we are in, whenever we cry out to you, you are with us to help pull us out and keep us on that pathway to the finish line. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity to worship you. Bless us now as we go home, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here and for being part of our service today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless.